a good afternoon. My name is Fred Hoff. I'm a senior fellow at the uh, Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East of the Atlantic Council. Uh, our program today uh, centers on the uh, Geneva Conference for Peace in Syria, which began uh, slightly less than a week ago, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, began with a uh, plenary session in uh, Montreux, Switzerland, attended by upwards of 40 foreign ministers, uh, followed by a day of consultations by Special Representative Lakhtar Brahimi, which with each of the Syrian delegations separately, followed thereafter uh, by, uh, by meetings between the delegations uh, in the presence uh, of, uh, of Mr. Brahimi. Uh, we're very, very, very happy today to have two superb commentators on this situation. Our goal today is to get a sense of what's happened so far and uh, to the extent possible what we might anticipate over the, uh, over the coming uh, days and weeks. Indeed, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry indicated uh, several weeks ago his belief uh, that this could be a, a process lasting for months. And it may be that, uh, maybe that that's what, uh, what we're looking at. Uh, with us today, uh, seated with me to my, uh, to my right, is uh, Mona Yakubian, who is Senior Advisor at the uh, Stimson Center's Middle Eastern Program. Work focuses on Arab uprisings uh, with a particular concentration on uh, Syria. Uh, she's Director of Pathways to Progress, Peace, Prosperity, and Change in the Middle East, a joint initiative with the George C. Marshall Foundation. Uh, Mona is a, is a former uh, U.S. government uh, official, a person who I've always found uh, to be one of the most reliable, balanced, and articulate uh, commentators. Uh, on, these, uh, on these terrible issues uh, that we're facing, uh, both in Syria and in Lebanon in particular, where, uh, where Mona's done some uh, absolutely extraordinary work. Uh, also uh, checking in with us from, uh, from Geneva uh, is the person whose, uh, whose presence is really, is really responsible uh, for us having this, uh, this program uh, this afternoon. Uh, Basil Korkor is the legal advisor and Acting Deputy Representative, National Coalition of the Syrian Revolution and Opposition Forces. Uh, he is a Syrian-American attorney, serves as U.S. Consul to the Syrian Coalition's Washington and United Nations offices. Uh, he advises the Syrian Coalition on various legal and foreign policy issues including sanctions compliance, economic development, UN diplomacy, and international negotiations. Uh, Basil has been counseling Syrian opposition groups and humanitarian organizations uh, throughout the course of the conflict. Uh, he previously practiced in the National Security Group of Arnold and Porter LLP uh, here in Washington. Why don't I turn to Mona? Why don't you uh, start us <laughs> off and uh, give us give us your sense of uh, of uh, what's been developing over the past five or six sure. days? Well, of course, I, I can't give you the on the ground from Geneva perspective, but I do think um, what I would say is we came into this with the bar quite low, uh, and I think probably properly so. I think none of us had any notion that there was going to be a significant breakthrough. Clearly, we haven't had that. From my perspective, the fact that Basel is still there in Geneva is significant. The fact that while there is no real forward progress, there has not been an outright collapse of the talks, I think is noteworthy. Um, it's also noteworthy, I think, that you have, uh, for the first time, face-to-face -face talks between the Syrian regime and the opposition. And the opposition really, at least from a perception perspective, is on equal footing. And frankly, I think we'll hear more from Basel on this, but from my perspective, they've conducted themselves quite well in terms of sticking to the purpose of the talks, uh, Geneva I, and movement toward a transition government. 
Um, so, you know, I, I actually think that there, there is something important going on here, though we're not seeing substantive progress on the ground. I know that today, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this when Basel comes back up, there was a suspension uh, of the talks, and that's certainly not a good sign. But again, from my perspective, the fact that we don't have an outright collapse um, suggests that both sides see some value in dialogue and in continuing to talk. Um, and I think that's actually quite important because I think the, the flip side of that is they perhaps both believe that the alternative to some level of negotiations and diplomacy is pretty grim. And I think what we've seen in the past when diplomacy has failed, uh, as we did in July of 2012, was a very significant deterioration on the ground inside Syria. And it, it would be my hope that we could avoid that. You know, I think, uh, I think Secretary Kerry and for that matter, the, uh, the UN Secretary General have, uh, you know, have made it clear uh, that the main, the main deliverable of this Geneva process is supposed to be a, a, a transitional governing body uh, negotiated on the basis of mutual consent that would uh, exercise full executive power consistent with, uh, with human rights standards. Uh, what, what is your sense of of, of, of how these two delegations uh, can actually make some progress on this, on this centerpiece? I think it's gonna be extraordinarily difficult, hence the notion, and I see Basil back, but hence the notion that this is going to take, you know, months, and that that's an optimistic perspective. But let me let me step back and let you Good. let you bring Basil. Okay, back Basil, in. Uh, if you're if you're back with us, uh, go ahead, and I'll try not to jinx it this time. <laughs> yeah, if you can hear me, I think the last thing I heard you say was, "and the person whose presence here," and then I cut out. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thanks, uh, Ambassador Hoff and uh, and Professor Yakubi, and great to um, virtually see you guys again. And and uh, I understand. Um, uh, there, there's other folks there as well, and, I, and I'm really actually looking forward to hearing from your perspective because I think we, we acknowledged uh, fairly early on that a lot of how this played out, uh, you know, there were sort of two sides to it. One was what happened diplomatically um, here, and the other is what happened politically elsewhere. Um, and so uh, here as we're about um, a week into it, I'd, I'd like, I very much look forward to hearing um, the impressions um, of you and the others there. We we were uh, scheduled to come out here. It was obviously it was a it was a late and a, and a quite a political process. But um, the decision to um, uh, attend uh, the conference was made um, more or less uh, at the last minute uh, in late January, uh, I think around the 18th. And at that point, we had started. Um, we booked our tickets to come out from Washington uh, on Monday. Um, and then we got the word from the uh, UN that the Secretary General had invited um, Iran to participate uh, in the uh, in the conference. At that point, um, the coalition chose to take a, a pretty hard line on that, and I think the U.S. did too, and some other allies. Um, and we actually we canceled our flights um, to make to make the point that we wouldn't uh, come out unless either. Um, and really, it was either of these two options. Uh, either Iran was uninvited or, um, and not, not, and I think this part gets downplayed, or Iran accepts the basis of the negotiation conference, which was the Geneva communique, uh, which is widely recognized uh, by the international community, multiple times by the Friends of Syria, and even in a United Nations Security Council resolution. And we know how rare and sensitive those are uh, when it comes to Syria. So, if they weren't willing to accept the, the, the Geneva communique, um, it, it, it was almost negotiating in order to negotiate. So anyway, uh, my, my story is we, we canceled our, uh, our flights. Late that night, my wife went into labor uh, a little bit early <laughs> in Washington, uh, so, uh, went to the hospital. Uh, meanwhile, we're getting word that the Secretary General rescinded the invitation to Iran. So we're rebooking our flights for the next day. So I was there to be there for the birth of my daughter, which I was 
extremely happy about um, there in Washington. Um, and I, I guess I have uh, the UN and the Ayatollahs to thank for that. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to tell you the real story behind that. Um, you know, since we got out here, um, and, I, and I do mean it, that, I, that I'm very interested in hearing um, the, the impressions you guys have of that. Um, we've, we've tried, the opposition's approach to this has been one that, first of all, was months in the making. I should say this, although final decision, the absolute final decision to attend wasn't made until around the 18th and then uh, had to be made again around the, the 19th or 20th. Um, we had spent months preparing. Uh, this this team had, uh, the, the, the coalition had appointed a, um, a committee to prepare for the uh, conference, uh, almost regardless of who would end up um, representing the coalition or advising the coalition, we wanted to have something in place. You know, they thought it was important to build up something somewhat institutional. Uh, research, the resources, the position development, uh, the strategy, the media, the outside resources that would be needed to go into the conference, and of course the training. So there were several months where many organizations and countries were hosting uh, negotiation simulations or negotiation trainings or lectures um, that, that many more people in the opposition attended than could possibly um, rep represent in Geneva. Uh, and, and I think that was good. It was good because uh, we need as many people trained as possible. And we also need people who aren't here to be trained and understand what's happening so that they can relate to other Syrian constituencies why it's important that we're here and why it's important that we have this conversation, even though the doom and gloom surrounding it and the weeks uh, preceding uh, was was uh, almost uh, 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 so pessimistic that 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 uh, one might not have hope for uh, for even attending. Uh, Mona, is it your understanding that the uh, that the Geneva final communique has been accepted by the regime? It is my understanding that it has not yeah. been accepted by the regime. And I, I think that is the crux of the issue. And I think that's really why we are facing such long and arduous negotiations. And Fred, you, of course, know the Geneva Communique better than anyone having been there and have been played a key role in its inception. And in some ways, I think you, you could help enlighten us a bit more. But my sense is that even back in 2012, uh, the document was kept purposefully ambiguous uh, in order to allow for some kind of very early consensus to be built between, in particular, the United States and Russia. And I think that that consensus, or what, whatever <coughs> small bit of shared ground there might be between the U.S. and Russia, has been, has been instrumental in ultimately beginning to move this process forward. The problem is, now we're in a place where those ambiguities are now coming to the fore in a way to actually perhaps inhibit the talks. As we know, the Syrian regime has really done everything it can leading up to and into the talks to make this be a discussion about terrorism in Syria, to obfuscate the real issues which have to do with in vitro transition, uh, they, they're talking about the need to get the goal on back, and they're, they're, they're going all over the place in terms of uh, talking about everything but the topic that should be at hand. And that's an extra, that, that, that to my mind is, is really where the challenge lies. <coughs> I agree. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the discussion at, uh, at Geneva 1, uh, you're correct. There is a degree of, uh, of ambiguity. Uh, during the talks, uh, P5 talks at the working level, uh, there was initially uh, strong desire on the part of the United States, Great Britain, and France uh, to specify uh, that the current president of Syria uh, and his closest associates would not, would not be part of any uh, interim governing arrangement uh, for Syria. Uh, our Russian and Chinese colleagues objected to uh, They also objected to the formulation uh, having to do with people people with blood on their hands, uh, observing that you know people would see this as a reference to uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, so, so in the end, this was the genesis of the uh, of the mutual consent clause, uh, which in essence uh, would give each side a, uh, a veto 
over a person nominated by the other uh, to serve on the uh, transitional governing body, and this this explains uh, the somewhat uh, somewhat direct and heated arguments uh, that Secretary Kerry makes uh, to the effect uh, that it is impossible for Bashar al-Assad uh, to be serving in any transitional <coughs> governing body. Uh, in a literal sense, that's not accurate. Uh, the opposition uh, could hypothetically consent uh, to some kind of a role for Bashar al-Assad, uh, perhaps in the nature of serving out his term, uh, which I believe uh, expires in, uh, in July of this year. But, uh, but I think that, uh, that Kerry is essentially accurate when he says in the, in the, you know, the normal course of things, uh, a mutually agreed transitional governing body will virtually, by definition, um, exclude uh, Bashar al-Assad. Now, given the fact uh, that the parties are not likely to engage on this most sensitive of subjects, what about the humanitarian? side of things. You, you, you've written and spoken extensively right. about this. Is, is there a possibility of this, of this process actually producing something worthwhile here? Well, we had all gone in hopeful that that is exactly what would happen, that there would be some uh, confidence building measures that would have to do with uh, humanitarian access being negotiated. There was discussion about homes being a place where there would be uh, access to those civilians that have been trapped there for months and months and months. Unfortunately, uh, the Syrian government is continuing to play an obstructing role on this, and that's deeply problematic, uh, Fred. But from my perspective, um, I really do believe that in the absence of any prospect for short-term progress on moving toward uh, a transition government, that these issues of humanitarian access in particular have to remain front and center. And I think in order to achieve that, it's going to be essential to broaden the discussions or have parallel talks that bring in key players in the region who can exert pressure, in particular on, this, on the Syrian regime, to play more of a, of a constructive role. Uh, and so, so I, and I actually think if there is some progress made, that will actually enhance the opposition's credibility. They will be able to show something tangible for having started to participate in this process, and I think that's essential. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you very strongly on that. You know, John, John Kerry himself has said that in terms of uh, political transition negotiations, one, one should not ex expect results on day one, day two, or day three, uh, this will be something that will take a long time to evolve, if it ever does. And, and what, it would, what it would require in the first instance is a, is a decision by Bashar al-Assad to authorize his delegation actually discuss the terms of a transitional governing body. Uh, there is no, there is no objective evidence at this point uh, that Bashar al-Assad is inclined to do that. Uh, his his own sense seems to be that he's <coughs> very well. That, that Iranian-raised militias are doing a fine job in uh, propping him up in the west of Syria. So he's he's in no no particular uh, rush to the exits, so to speak, and yet. The fact of this process in Geneva uh, may well uh, provide a rallying point in the sense that it, it does focus the attention of some key actors, uh, the United States, the United Nations, Russia, and I would say Iran in particular on the, uh, on the humanitarian abomination uh, that's taking place uh, in Syria. Uh, I, uh, I completed recently uh, some track two discussions uh, with some senior Iranians uh, who were very close to President Rouhani, the foreign minister, 
and even even the people who were involved on the ground inside Syria. And I must say, I'll just I'll simply report uh, what they said uh, without without any editorial comment. Uh, they indicated, uh, you know, first of all, a high degree of discomfort uh, with some of the actions of their client. Uh, some of the operations that are uh, obviously deliberately uh, aimed at terrorizing uh, civilian populations. Uh, they expressed interest in the possibility of discussing with the United States and others at an official level. Uh, how do we implement some kind of a humanitarian truce inside Syria. Uh, on the subject of authorizing unlimited, unhindered United Nations access, uh, there was a little pushback, and I, you know, I was told by America, other Americans at these meetings, people who actually know something about Iran, uh, that, that there, is, there is a bit of Iranian hesitation about the United Nations itself. Uh, but what it will, uh, my sense is that what it will really uh, come down to for Iran is a calculation. And, and one of our Iranian interlocutors put it very directly. He said, look, the Assad regime is doing well on the ground. If we're going to think about some kind of humanitarian steps, these have to be evaluated in terms of the interests of the parties. Okay? Uh, so while most of our Iranian interlocutors were, were very interested in moving forward, uh, there was one in particular, uh, one who was, I think, closer uh, to some of the people actually operating inside Syria, uh, who did express uh, some reservations about this. Um, <coughs> At this point, what I, what I would suggest is we'll open things up to questions and comments. If we get, uh, if we get Basil back online, uh, we'll just let him go straight through, and, uh, and at that point, uh, you can, I'll turn it over to questions again, uh, directly to him, because he's, uh, he's, really the, uh, he's really the reason why we wanted everybody here. Yes, sir. Is the microphone. microphone. Thank you all for the panel. My name is Mohammed Al Jamal, the director of CV Justice at the Capital Police Center. I'm not sure if I can ask the moderator, but I have two, two questions. One, you mentioned that other uh, of the Iranians are interested a little bit in moving forward the negotiation with the U.S. But they never expressed their interest of working on Syria by adopting Geneva 1 communique that as a base for the, the Geneva 2. That's one question. Yeah. The second thing is how do you read the US Congress today approving uh, military funds for the opposition in the South? In the South, that means there's no Anusra Front, there's no Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, but approving the funds now during Geneva communication because we get a comment from Dr. Ibrahim today saying he's very surprised that the US approve the arms the position during the negotiation. Thank you. All right, I'll start with the second. Uh, the second, the first, there are, there are press reports to the effect that there were some kind of uh, secret proceedings uh, in the U.S. Congress that, uh, that I guess, authorized uh, some level of armaments for, uh, for Syrian rebel forces. Uh, I, would emphasize, I would emphasize the word secret. I'm no, I'm no longer I'm no longer a U.S. government official. Uh, neither is Mona. And uh, you know, to be perfectly frank, uh, if, if some kind of arrangements were made, I'm not I'm not I'm not aware of them. Uh, on on Iran, uh, this is something that uh, that is well worth clarifying. In these track two uh, discussions, I refer to our Iranian interlocutors made it very clear. And they were unanimous on this. Uh, there is no interest on the part of Tehran for political transition in Syria. 
none, zero. Okay. And we were, we Americans were on the receiving end of a, of a rather detailed and direct <coughs> Iranian explanation for this. And, and it basically boiled down to this. Iran's primary interest in Syria is the role Syria plays in the support and upkeep of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Because as long as there is a threat, a prospect of Israeli air attacks on Iranian nuclear facilities, Iran will consider the Hezbollah missile and rocket force in the south of Lebanon as its first line of defense. Iran has come to the conclusion that there is nothing on this earth that is better than Bashar al-Assad in Syria uh, for providing that linkage to Hezbollah, logistical and otherwise. Right? That any replacement of Bashar al-Assad, any replacement of Bashar al-Assad from an Iranian perspective would not be as good as the real thing. Okay. And therefore, and therefore, Iran, as one of our interlocutors put it, <coughs> Assad is not a bargain point for us. Now, you know, it begs the question if in the future there's some kind of a nuclear agreement that Israel buys into and you know, the threat goes away, what then? Well, you know, I think the prospects of that happening are sufficiently far off so that it doesn't have any, any particular operational relevance to what we're talking about today. Where we, where we did detect a degree of Iranian flexibility and interest was on the specific topic of the humanitarian catastrophe going on in Syria. All of our Iranian interlocutors were uncomfortable with the extent of what's going on. None of them, none of them tried to cover up or obfuscate in any way the events of last August 21st. Iranians are quite clear about what happened and who did it. Right? And, and, and they don't mince words about what, what they're seeing in terms of other practices also. Uh, there is some interest there. Uh, obviously, these are track two discussions. It's a track one where you have to do your professional due diligence and see if there's any there there. I, I would hope that the United States and others are following up. Uh, with the Iranians to see if there's any there there because whatever whatever can be done uh, to mitigate this god awful situation in Syria uh, would be uh, would be all of the good. But it's my sense that Iran is an essential player in this, and uh, they have to be brought in in some way, shape, or form. Again, I, I certainly understand the, the concerns about them not endorsing Geneva, but I also think if we're going to be, we're going to be consistent, Russia's uh, interpretation of Geneva is also different from ours. So there is, again, the ambiguity. But secondly, I think, from my perspective, the way to go, as I said before, are parallel talks where Iran is not involved in the discussions that are Syrian to Syrian talks about ultimately political transition. But in order to, frankly, give these negotiations some strategic depth, I think it's going to be essential to bring Iran in, both in terms of from the humanitarian perspective. And I think there are, beyond what you noted, Fred, and I would agree, you know, there is, of course, as we know, competition going on within Iran. The Iranians don't speak with one voice. President Rouhani and Davos talked about their desire to engage constructively with the region, etc. So why not make this really a test of that proposition? 
by having them play a constructive role on this very specific issue of humanitarian aspect uh, uh, access precisely because of uh, how, how dire the situation is on the ground. And does that, in fact, perhaps also begin to open up possibilities down the road? I think diplomacy, by definition, is a very dynamic uh, process. We don't know in the, you know, by engaging in certain things, what other opportunities may open up. I also think it's essential that there be some kind of uh, discussions or dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia. These are the two key regional actors who are fueling this conflict. And unfortunately, Syria is no longer just a sectarian civil war inside Syria. It is now, as well, a regional, maybe even global proxy war. And so I would also put de-escalation alongside humanitarian access front and center as a key objective in the near term. And I think much could be accomplished by bringing Iran and Saudi Arabia around the table. Yeah, uh, and Turkey for that matter. And Turkey and Iraq, yeah, actually. I think, your, uh, I think your, your sense of the, uh, the necessity of parallel talks is, is, is not only spot on, but in fact, it's, it's facilitated uh, by the way this Geneva process uh, has been structured. Uh, Lakhdar Rahimi, uh, the special representative, uh, made it very clear that the, uh, the high-level plenary opening uh, would not be repeated anytime soon unless he saw a specific reason, he or the Secretary General, uh, to reconvene the 40 foreign ministers. So at one level, uh, there are just supposed to be talks between the two delegations, uh, but inevitably there are other delegations operating in and around Geneva, and I think that's that's where you can get uh, that's where you can get some of these discussions going. Uh, in our in our in our talks uh, with these uh, prominent Iranians, one of the uh, you know one of the points one of the points we made. Well, first of all, one of the points they made was that they considered, without doubt, the nuclear negotiations to be the main event in their, in their bilateral relationship uh, with the United States. Uh, so one of the points we tried to make, and I, and I think it was more or less accepted, is, you know, can you, given, given what you know about your client's behavior, can you be absolutely sure that there is nothing that he or some of his subordinates might do, nothing, that would actually attract the attention of the President of the United States and re-raise uh, the possibility of a, uh, of a credible threat of military strikes? And if your client does somehow create this president a shrubbery needs a moment, and it's acted upon, uh, then what impact would that have on any ongoing nuclear discussions between the United States and Iran? And there was, you know, there was, there was some interest in that proposition, uh, but, but also, also the sense that, uh, that Iran's, what, you know, what, what our Iranian interlocutors describe as Iran's traditional adversaries, the United States and Israel. Uh, their view was that neither the United States nor Israel has done anything of any real consequence in Syria. Uh, so the Iranian team said that it was feeling pretty comfortable about the state of affairs, that Iran had weathered the storm in Syria, uh, that the real problem was Saudi Arabia. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but at least the, the Iranian perspective we heard uh, was one in which uh, you know, the, the, the question of humanitarian work is possible to consider 
uh, but beyond that, any kind of Iranian role in facilitating uh, some kind of uh, political transition to Syria under current circumstances, just not on. Uh, that's what they said, whether or not they represent uh, the current thinking of the Supreme Leader, the President, uh, and others. Uh, I don't know. Questions? Sir. Thank you. Um, regarding Iran's position that, sorry, that humanitarian agreements may be a possibility, but regime change is not, um, is any sort of robust humanitarian agreement or humanitarian provision real, a realistic possibility so long as the current regime is in power? I'm, I'm wondering specifically about the role of spoilers uh, which is supporting the regime, but which the regime doesn't necessarily exercise comprehensive control over, such as militias supported by Iran. Um, so once the regime stays in power, um, wouldn't there be a danger that these militias would act against an agreement to uh, protect civilians and that would trash the humanitarian side? Um, well, no, certainly way, way in your, you know, my sense is that any kind of a humanitarian operation, whether whether it involves blanket authorization for UN humanitarian assistance agencies to, to go where they want, when they want, or if it involves a, a specific a specific locale like Homs, all of these operations are going to be operationally challenging uh, because there are a variety of actors on the ground uh, you know the regime the regime may be responsible for the you know for the vast majority of humanitarian outrages in Syria but it's not alone in terms of outrages uh, so yeah and I mean you know in some respects it's it's easy enough for us to say, and I think it's correct to say, that the, uh, that the Syrian regime should grant unhindered access uh, to the United Nations. Uh, but on the other hand, put yourself in the position of a UN relief worker in Syria, uh, accompanying a relief or leading a relief convoy into one of these neighborhoods. Uh, this is uh, heavy lifting, to say the least. I wouldn't add much. I would just underscore exactly the point you make. I mean, as we're having this discussion, the reality on the ground in Syria is so complex and so rapidly evolving. You have, again, from IRGC representatives, you have other Shia militias coming from Iraq and elsewhere. You have, of course, a large number of foreign fighters, Sunni fighters, and jihadist elements. I, I think today there was some uh, attack uh, on, I, mean, I think the jihadists and other uh, various and sundry uh, armed forces on both sides of the conflict who are not in favor of negotiations will act to undermine the talks on the ground through by undertaking attacks, by blocking access, by doing all kinds of things. So it's, it's yet one more challenge to contend with. Yeah, I think the real... Hey, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, Basil, you're back on? <laughs> Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? I'm on a good old-fashioned cellular telephone now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go, go for it. Thanks. Thanks for your patience. Well, oh, thank you. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what it is. but uh, I, I don't know how not when I was talking about the first face-to-face -face meeting earlier, but, um, I, you know, like I said, we had our negotiating team appointed, and when they walked into the room, um, the other side of the table was was a completely, uh, almost entirely junior staff level um, delegation. From the, the only person there, I think, was uh, the first day was uh, Bashar Jafari, who was the, um, the the government's ambassador or permanent representative from the United Nations, and he's he's obviously um, a more empowered uh, a figure. But the others, um, you know, they, there was no Bethany Shaban, there was no Walid Malim. Uh, there was no Manzabi. There was there was just, um, there wasn't who they thought would be there. Um, so you know, weren't quite sure how to take that at first. 
but um, you know this this was a team on our side. Like I said, we had done a lot of preparation for this, and this wasn't a team that was going to give up at the first uh, curveball. So they decided to uh, to sit through it, and, and they'd had a pretty good day at Montreux. They felt uh, at least coming into it that the the regime was just sounding like a um, like a regime. I mean, it was sounding like a dictatorship, and and the fact is, when they get down to it and they've got the talk, what we're seeing in action here is that dictators that don't like to listen, they don't have to listen, um, let alone negotiate. It's not, it's not part of the job description of a dictator, quite literally. So um, that's that's becoming evident. Um, we've been getting the sense as well that, that, that there was something that uh, it wasn't necessarily a purely strategic move, but there might be something there. Um, uh, between, say, the regime uh, uh, delegation here in Geneva and, in fact, uh, and Damascus itself, um, we started getting um, getting into the three, the first two days uh, to focus mostly on the humanitarian access and hunts. Um, you know, with our priority coming into this, we've made it clear many times, our, our allies have all made it clear, um, was transition, was formation, setting the stage for forming a transitional governing body. Um, that could begin to replace the, uh, take the full executive authority of the president and begin to replace this government, set the stage for constitutional reform, reconciliation, um, elections, free and fair and open elections, uh, national unification of, of armed forces, security sector reform, everything. Um, but there is, let's be honest, even though it is of the regime's making, there is a humanitarian disaster on the floor, uh, on the ground, and while we need not uh, try to squeeze too much into um, one session, we did think that um, the situation, Humps in particular, uh, we had done enough uh, background, uh, both on the ground and, and uh, through back channels, that we saw an opportunity there uh, for these negotiations to start off with an opportunity to feed people, to get food to people who are trapped, um, who can't get access to food and medicine. Um, so, so we were quite open to that. We, we set aside the idea of the transition governing body for a moment uh, to get a uh, very, very pressing issue. Um, and we found, like I said, uh, on one hand, this, this delegation here um, just didn't seem empowered necessarily to make final decisions on that issue. Meanwhile, through, uh, through back negotiations uh, directly with Damascus, we learned that there was, in fact, some preparation there with the Red Cross uh, having loaded numerous trucks and uh, sent them towards Humps. Uh, and some and some conversations between Damascus and the governor of Homs that you know we could get this food into the into the folks. Now, the next thing that happened was um, was this announcement that that uh, JSR Brahimi made um, that there was an agreement on uh, uh, essentially what he described was an evacuation of Homs. Women and children could leave. Um, men could leave if they you know submitted their, their names and backgrounds for search um, and and in so doing we could we we're thereby providing you know humanitarian <coughs> relief to, uh, to the people of Hunt. I, I, I should be clear that that wasn't that wasn't the agreement um, quite simply that there wasn't that's not what was that's not what's needed in Humps. what's needed in Humps and what the agreement being discussed was was the uh, transportation and many trucks that were sitting there with the engines warm and the keys in the ignition to deliver tons and tons of food and medicine to the people trapped at Humps. This was not about um, evacuating the uh, women and children or as many of them uh, could get out and then, uh, you know, leaving behind uh, the men and, and those who couldn't escape to be subject to the regime of bombing again the city. Uh, this, this this may have sounded new in the media, but this wasn't new for the opposition. They, they've seen this in other cities in Wondermia where they released some people only to see them uh, arrested or even shot at in some cases. Um, so this this wasn't about evacuating uh, people and leaving the city vulnerable to, to, to that uh, exposure to bombs and, and, uh, and massacres. This was about getting food, and still is, about getting food, water, and medicine to starving and I'm sure terrified people um, inside Humps. So that's actually still ongoing as, as, as recently as the most recent um, negotiation session, which was a few hours ago, um, that, that issue came up again. Uh, another thing that, um, that came up uh, today, so 
yesterday the regime uh, took, took its chance uh, to uh, to discuss an issue of importance to them. It was an issue of importance to everybody, but <coughs> the way they frame it is, is not quite accurate. And that's the issue of terrorism or anti-terrorism. Um, you know, you may know from the rhetoric and, and, and the way they describe the opposition, um, they, they don't recognize legitimacy of opposition. Even sitting here across the table and, and uh, at the U.N., uh, they insist uh, in the public media that they don't um, recognize the legitimacy of, of, of the opposition. Uh, at the same time, of course, they're sitting across the table. Um, they, they refer to terrorists, uh, to, to the opposition as, as all terrorists. They don't distinguish. If you bring up the issue of women and children, which, which the, uh, the uh, Human Rights Committee within our delegation made a, made a presentation of, uh, well, we, we spent a lot of time gathering thousands and thousands of names and eventually made a presentation of upwards of uh, 2,500 names of detained women and children. Um, some of these very, very young children, um, to to the regime. And the response was, well, look, even women and children um, are suspects, they're potential threats. And so, uh, you know, we're not going to agree to just this mass release of, of children and women. Um, and in fact, uh, we saw that reflected again the next day when we got back to Homs, that now that the women and children who they wanted to evacuate from Homs would also need to be subject to a a search um, and uh, search isn't quite the same as, as at the TSA checkpoints here. Uh, when they say teftish uh, in Syria, you're talking about the mukhabarat or the uh, military um, uh, forcibly you know, searching and clearing any threats that, that they perceive. So um, again, uh, this is this is this is what they're dealing with, and this is still their posture in the negotiations. Um, we, we took a different approach. Our, our delegation did something just a few hours ago um, uh, that I thought was, 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 quite, um, was, was quite empowering for us. Um, we had, as I said, for months been preparing. One of the things that, that we prepared the, and, uh, was a, essentially a document that laid out our vision for the future series. Now, again, these are very lofty lofty ideals about democracy, a civil society, pluralism, um, free and fair elections, uh, inclusion and non-discrimination, equality, access to justice, uh, these ideas that, that, you know, sort of underpin some of what, what um, you know, we consider our most dear ideals here in the U.S., um, or, or I should say there in the U.S., um, but nevertheless, it was a discussion we thought, even though it was very broad and lofty, we thought it was a discussion that was important to have. Um, and so the delegation and the, the, the chief negotiator read this document uh, to the, uh, and this was in, uh, this was the day after the regime uh, tabled its document, um, which was ostensibly a, a document against terrorism, but essentially was a um, basically a, 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 a labeling the entire uh, uprising, armed or non-armed or anything else as a. Uh, seditious or terrorist activity. So, so that was a non-starter. But what we tabled and said was this vision. For Syria. And, and, and it wasn't set in stone. We wanted to have a discussion. The, the, our negotiators wanted to engage the other negotiators, the other side, in a true constructive conversation about what we want Syria to look like. And then let's talk about the mechanism. Now, for us, that all is under the auspices of the transitional governing body. Even the vision of what Syria is going to be and how it's going to get there. Who's going to set the stage for that? It's not the current government. It's the transitional governing body that's been agreed to, even, as I said, in the, in the UN Security Council. So um, uh, we, we put that out there this, uh, this morning in the session. Uh, our negotiating team, our lead negotiator put it out there this morning. Um, the, the government uh, spent most of its time uh, in this most recent session um, uh, essentially now uh, bashing the U.S., um, ranting, actually, I would say, against the United States, against the opposition's relationship with the United States, against the meddling in, in Syrian affairs and, and that sort of thing. Um, it, it, it Frankly, it seemed almost uh, uh, off-putting to, to anyone in the room, and I would, I would include uh, probably the mediators of the negotiations in that, uh, because uh, here, you know, our, our team was trying to begin to engage in this conversation about what we see and what you see and how we can get there and, and, and how we can make this transitional governing body and this transition 
work. Um, and it wasn't even a demand that someone step down today or tomorrow. Um, it was about what we see uh, coming in the future, and, and the reaction wasn't there. Um, and in fact, I'll say, um, after that, we have, uh, for, the, for the first time today, um, we're told that there would not be an evening session. So actually right now, normally I'd be, I'd be heading over um, to the evening session, but uh, after the, the way that the morning session went, uh, and I don't mean to say that anyone walked out, or, which didn't happen. There wasn't any cancellation. The schedule sort of set day by day at the end of each session. We learn what the next one is. But uh, I thought it was interesting that the, that the mediators um, had thought that there might not be a need for a, a, a second session today in particular. So, so the teams will convene again uh, tomorrow morning. Um, that's sort of the, the latest. I mean, I, I could, I guess, I don't want to, if I had, I didn't have as much time as we'd hoped, and I could uh, go into some of the technical uh, aspects of how this stuff is working out here. Well, Basil, uh, Basil, but if let there are any me, questions, uh, I'm happy to give as short of an answer as I can. Yeah, Basil, let me, uh, let me break in here, and uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to open it up to everybody for questions, and uh, I'll, get, I'll get the ball rolling with one. Given... Given the fact uh, that there doesn't seem to be any kind of substantive uh, discussion so far about, uh, about political transition, and, uh, and given the fact that uh, even, the, even the humanitarian side of the discussions is, is hitting, hitting some roadblocks, what, what, what do you see as the, uh, as the coalition's objectives? Uh, say for the uh, say for the balance of this month and on into February over the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, what is uh, what is your sense of what can be achieved here? Uh, well, they're clear about their objective. Their objective is to reach an agreement. Um, and that is that is what they're pushing for. This is not this is not a PR stunt. This is not an attempt to appease people. In fact, the, the opposition delegation that's here went through an incredibly intense, high-pressure, stressful, um, at, at, at personal and political expense process to, um, to end up attending uh, these. So, so, so it, this, is not, this is not for show. They're here to reach an agreement. Um, they're here under the auspices of the Geneva Communique, the full transition. That will be the goal. And yes, uh, uh, as you said, Ambassador Hopp, it's not a one-week process. Um, I don't know that it's a you know a year or two year process, but certainly it's not a week process either. Um, but that, that's where this has to go. This is about helping end the conflict um, just for so many reasons. As a practical matter, unless there's a transition, there simply can't be support and the stability that's needed to move on with the reconciliation, the reconstruction, the democratization, unification um, that's needed to end this uh, conflict. So so. The, the goal is the same. The goal is to establish a transitional governing body eventually um, and set the stage for this, for this transition. Um, the lack of, the lack of um, the substantive progress over the first few days isn't going to deter this opposition from, uh, from, from working um, towards that end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mona, do you, would, you, would you care to pose a question or, Why not? or just let's, open it up? I, I, let's let the audience participate. Yes, sir. Mohammed Ghanem, Senior Political Advisor with the Syrian American Council. I have a, a couple of quick questions. Um, barring a shift in the strategic balance on the ground, I think the utmost that we can get out of Geneva is some palliative measures, plus some release of some prisoners. But definitely nothing substantive. The question is, uh, and I don't think that any game changer is in the cards right now, so barring this shift in, in balance or political will to affect that, that shift, do you think that eventually, if the process collapses, that that will check the box for President Obama because the process will have put on display the intransigence of the Assad regime? That's the first question. Second question, there, are, there were multiple reasons why the administration did not go ahead with the strikes. But do you think that concern over uh, the nuclear deal with Iran was one of them. Thanks. Would you care to take a uh, shot so at that? So first, or? on the first point, um, sorry, Mohammed, can you guys hear me? No, go ahead, Basil. Go ahead. Okay. 
yeah, and sure. The first point, um, you know, certainly the opposition is not here to check a box. This is not about uh, what we could do to get more support in the future. I, I don't know that dynamics will shift so much that um, because you know we spent a week negotiating, they're all of a sudden going to you know change their foreign policy. I don't know that that's in the cards, and I don't think they're here to check that box um, to get to get more support. Of course, you know. This is a simultaneous process. They're also lobbying, so they have been before and will continue to do, to get more support uh, for the cause, um, uh, regardless of, uh, of this. Um, uh, you, you know, on the, uh, on the shift on the ground, let me just say quickly that the latest activity on the ground from, uh, from the perspective of the, um, of the moderate, uh, the Free Syrian Army here, um, obviously, the past few weeks has, has actually been uh, not so directly against the regime, but, but against uh, the Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, Daesh or ISIS or ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or, or however you um, choose to, to label them. But uh, that, that is a terrorist group. They reject the leadership and the legitimacy of the opposition and, and all the opposition. And, in fact, the opposition uh, feels that it reciprocates um, that to them. And, in fact, uh, you know, they were doing in the places where they were taking authority was was as bad or worse than what the regime was doing, uh, and so it did take um, that realization uh, after some time, um, uh, you know, sort of really really a regrettable complacency uh, in some places on the behalf of some people to turn against these groups, and they've done that. And so the battle on the ground is against those groups just as much against the regime. This is an anti-terror operation um, to to root out the um, the uh, Al Qaeda groups, terrorist groups in Syria. It's an incredibly important. And Geneva, frankly, no matter what results from it, won't directly do anything to solve that problem because that problem is, irreg is regardless of, uh, of any political agreement, respect any political agreement. That's a threat that has to be dealt with. It's much better dealt with when they're not at the same time fighting, um, you know, fellow Syrians who are who are attacking cities and starving people. So, so that. The latest on the ground, um, from from uh, from our perspective. Here. Um, on the second point about Iran, I mean, I think uh, I'm probably not the best person here to address that question, uh, but it's it's not something that's part of the daily uh, calculations uh, here in here in Geneva. Um, it is it's there, of course, but it's not something that's affecting our strategy or asks or anything like that. Very good. Would anybody like to uh, to pose a question to uh, Basil directly about uh, about what's uh, what's going on? Hi, it's Mark Kelly from the British Embassy. Uh, just a quick question for Basil. Um, at the end of the week, the talks are meant to uh, stop for a short period until they resume again in about seven or ten days' time. If there's no progress on the on the humanitarian access and there's no progress on the political track, how hard will it be for the uh, opposition to come back to talks in seven to day, ten days' time? Um, yeah, thanks, Mark. So, so, first of all, this is a process where very, very many people are getting very little sleep. Um, this is a around-the-clock process. We're literally averaging an hour and a half to two hours of sleep. Mm -hmm a night if we can grab it. Um, the people are working around the clock to try and build something substantive to reach an agreement. Um, and I mean that on every level, detainee exchange, um, humanitarian aid to Hums, uh, and the political transition. Um, if there is to be a break and then a resumption, um, that doesn't mean uh, a break in the efforts. It means it may mean a break in the direct, uh, these day-to-day -day shuttling and negotiations, but um, it won't. It won't. It doesn't take uh, uh, formal sessions here in Geneva to to keep talking and to keep uh, working towards achieving that humanitarian aid. So that's something you know we should we should we should be seeing that soon. We should be seeing it right away. Um, it's something that we shouldn't. It doesn't even need negotiation. This is a case where the opposition, uh, you know, the, the regime is not negotiating against the interests of the opposition. It's negotiating directly against the interests of women and children and civilians who are starving in a city that's besieged, surrounded by armies, uh, and being bombed. So this is not um, something that requires a mediator in a room to try and figure out. So this is something I believe that the opposition will continue to push for very publicly, 
politically lobbying, not only here uh, with with the, uh, other Syrians and um, and the mediators, but with with allies, with enemies, uh, with uh, opponents, with anyone who can help get food and drink to these people. Uh, Basil, if I if I may pose a question, what uh, what has the uh, what has the government uh, delegation actually said? What has been its reply to the uh, to the question of whether or not it uh, accepts the uh, the uh, Geneva uh, uh, final member uh, final communique? Um, once again, um, Ambassador, their response here has been different than it's been before, frankly. Um, we, uh, in fact, directly uh, uh, looked into this uh, today um, at, the, at the morning session, uh, where the same, um, uh, the same representative who's negotiating on, the, on, the, on behalf of the government there, uh, uh, Ambassador Jafari, um, had, a, had a quote um, on the, uh, the day after the adoption of... Uh, the, uh, the OPCW resolution, Security Council Resolution 2118, where they welcomed and supported um, the inclusion of the Geneva One Clause in the Security Council Resolution and believed in the uh, implementation, fully support the implementation uh, of, of Geneva One at a, at a negotiated process. Uh, so, so they're on the record with that. Now, what you've seen in the lead up to the and in fact, in Secretary General uh, Secretary General's invitation to those to attend this conference, um, it says quite clearly that acceptance of the invitation to attend this conference, I'm um, paraphrasing, um, uh, equates to the acceptance of the premise of the negotiations, which is the implement full implementation of the Geneva Communique. Um, now, they wrote back, they accepted the invitation, and then they also wrote a letter saying, well, we're not comfortable with everything in the invitation, but... But, you know, they're here. That's the point of the discussions. That's something that is agreed across the board. Um, so, so, in a sense, that's what they've said before. Now, what they've said here, again, it's, it's closer to what you saw in that letter, which is uh, you know, Geneva Communique has some, has some nice things in it, but we don't want to go with all of it. I think the exact language is something like, the, you know, not everything in the Geneva Communique, not every word is sacred. Um, and, and in fact, there are some things in the six-point plan and Kofi Annan six-point plan, which is incorporated into the Geneva Communique, mm -hmm. um, that they would prefer to focus on. Um, uh, terrorism was one of those examples. Now, of course, as has been said repeatedly, the terrorism here, uh, look, no one denies that there's that there's terrorist activity there. In fact, again, the opposition is directly fighting against it um, uh, in many instances. But um, uh, the, the root of it and the ability to actually solve it and to take it on both politically and militarily and in any way you financially any way you can imagine um, can't happen with any kind of earnest uh, uh, attempt or uh, effectiveness um, until this until this transition takes place or at least begins. Can I jump in with a please, Basil? This is Mona. Just a quick, almost follow up to that. Um, understanding that Bashar al-Assad is clearly the decider in every sense of the word. Do you or any of your colleagues sense any possible um, divisions within the Syrian government uh, delegation, any possibility of, of cracks and potential uh, fissures that could be exploited? Um, I, w I want to just on the, on, the, on the first part of the question, uh, that he's the he's the decider in every sense of the word. Um, I, you know, he, he is uh, within the Syrian government. There's no question. Um, he's the he's the ultimate authority, um, and I have no doubt that that extends to the um, to this negotiating team. I, I don't know that the decisions and the positions that that he takes or that the country takes are necessarily. I don't think that necessarily means they're not affected by other decision makers. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of. Uh, some of the, those who have stood um, uh, with him, like Russia and Iran, uh, and some of those who also, some of those who have stood against him, but have not put so much pressure on the ground that, on him that, that, that forced him to step away. So when these when these invitations came out, um, when when this idea came out, you know, the question we had, the opposition debated it. Actually, had a preliminary agreement to go to the conference months ago. That was even uh, quite quite broad um, in its in its um, in the concurrence there, but. Um, the question we always had was, why would the regime go? We know why the 
U.S. and Russia and, and the fellow news folks want to convene in the U.N. We know why the opposition wants to go. But why does the regime, why would the regime go? Because if you literally implement the Geneva Communique in any capacity, even if you don't do the full transition, the full authority that we're talking about, any kind of implementation of it is a reduction in power and authority of the regime that, at least it seems, on the ground it can win militarily, or at least maintain enough territory to maintain that kind of legitimacy in most of the country or some of it. So the answer to that question wasn't clear. And to me, I'm not sure it's still, after a week of negotiations, it is clear. Uh, where would the regime go? The answer has to be there. There's got to be pressure. The answer is pressure. And the pressure can either be from its allies, uh, Russia and Iran, who start to see um, that there is an alternative they can live with, and frankly, that comes to us, that comes to the opposition. Um, it falls on the opposition to uh, demonstrate to those, uh, to the Russians and to others that um, you know, this is what the opposition stands for. This is what they envision. They're not looking to kick, you know, uh, to, to reduce, just completely um, extract the interests uh, of sphere of influence of one country from, from Syria and replace it with others or to, to gift Syria to some other country who stood by the, the opposition as opposed to, you know, uh, countries that did. And this is, this is not a, this is not a, a revenge or a, a vengeance or even an attempt to take power or take control. This is not an opposition that's fighting to take control of the government. This is opposition that's fighting to establish a system whereby people can elect their representative government. Um, so if they can make that case and respect minorities and be inclusive and have a, a, a strong military ties and security interests that, that the world will share, if they can make that case, then maybe that's the beginning of the reduction in pressure uh, a reduction in support from, from the traditional allies. On the other hand, something that I believe was alluded to earlier, which is it could also be pressure from the opponents of the regime, the friends of Syria, the U.S., uh, uh, Arab countries, and Turkey, and others, who could actually increase their support on the ground or politically um, uh, uh, increase the pressure on the regime and on its supporters um, to force the transition. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it's just the fact that he's the ultimate decision maker and we're essentially negotiating a reduction in his authority uh, that that means that, that that there's no point in negotiating. I think there's there are many levels to this. One of which Ambassador Hoff referenced earlier, and I, I have no doubt that there are other um, aspects to it. Um, so I, I do think it's something that that we earnestly see as an opportunity to to move on and get to the task of repairing the country instead of uh, instead of fighting. Well, well, Basil, thank you. We've uh, we've we've reached the uh, limit of our allotted time here. I just uh, before you uh, before you make another attempt at getting a couple of hours sleep. Uh, any, any closing comments from your end? Uh, no. Um, uh, well, I, I, um, this is ongoing. Um, I believe um, uh, Ambassador Hoff, you said something about wanting to hear about the inside baseball. And, and I'm thinking, well, this is, this is not even a seventh inning stretch yet. <laughs> I think maybe <laughs> after the season we can reflect on a lot more. But in the meantime, I would very much like to hear, like I said, I, I didn't get a chance to as much as I, I'd like, but to hear from folks who are there who are following this and studying this. Uh, and a number of you actually have, have sent in some comments to us and some thoughts to us. And we, you know, we're not, this is no pride of, of, of authorship on what the opposition is doing here. Like I said, they did it with teams, with outsiders, with people who haven't, necessarily been in the political sphere before, but technocrats and professionals and uh, academics and thinkers. So anything, if there's any way to funnel information or thoughts, we're, we're open to it. And, and um, as recently as yesterday, we had someone from one of the Washington think tanks come out and sit with us uh, for a while, and, and it was very helpful. So um, I do hope that the dialogue continues. We look for it uh, proactively as well on, on the Internet and on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere. We have an entire team doing that and sending out updates all the time. So I do hope the dialogue continues. It's very important that the U.S. and those in the U.S. realize that what happens in Syria is very, very important to the United States, morally, politically, militarily, diplomatically, security-wise. It's extremely important to, what, 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 to the United States, and we hope that the dialogue there doesn't die dead. We hope that everyone there gets, um, gets as much uh, into this as we do, because that's the kind of thing that will move us forward. So thank you on that note, Ambassador Hoff and, and Professor Yacubian for doing this, and I hope, I hope this uh, type of activity will continue uh, even while we're negotiating. Uh, well, thank you, Basil. We, uh, we look forward to uh, having you back here uh, in person uh, before long so, uh, so we uh, won't have to deal with these technological challenges. Mona, any 
closing remarks? Maybe just again, my own endorsement of what Basil just said, the importance of dialogue. I think Mohammed's question about what would happen if the talks fail, will President Obama change his calculus? My sense is I don't think he will. Uh, I think, I, I think our, this president has shown a real aversion to funneling significant, sophisticated weaponry into the battlefield. I, I actually am fearful that your question illustrates precisely the danger of what will happen should the talks fail, which is um, kind of a, a, a reflexive response to escalate on the ground. And my own sense is that will only put a solution further away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all uh, very much for coming today. And thank you for your patience.